I am Claire Raffle. Um, I'm the deputy director at the Tisch Food Center uh, here at Teachers College. This is my colleague, Pam Cook. She's our director, and she's on the faculty in the nutrition program, which is what we're a part of. Um, so I am so grateful that you're taking your Saturday to come be with us. This is awesome. Um, so thanks so much for joining. And we're going to have um, this be partially interactive. I will do some talking. I do have about like a 15 to 20 minute presentation, but then um, there's going to be an activity and there's going to be time to share. So um, hopefully folks are willing to engage a little bit and, um, you know, it's going to take, there's a little courage involved at the end of this, but that's what advocacy entails. So, um, so what we'll do is I want to start with intros, but I really want to like have us all have a chance to share. Um, come on, if you don't mind just sort of squeezing in a little bit. Um, and then I'll give um, a quick presentation and then we'll do the activity. Um, and then there's actually an, like an advocacy action that you can take at the very end. So that's the agenda. Um, so for intros, I mean, we're, it's actually really nice that we're this sort of small group because I really wanted to hear, before I jump into this, I wanted to get a sense of who's in the room um, and have all of us have a sense to um, get a sense of who is here, what, if any, our experience with advocacy is, and what you would hope to get out of this. Like, why did you choose this um, instead of one of the other um, settings? So, again, Claire Raffle from the Tisch Food Center. Um, and my experience with advocacy has been, um, for the past many years, I have worked on various aspects of um, food policy at the federal, state, and local level. But I think the thing to say is that I have learned it all on the job. I constantly feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. And <laughs> I rely on my colleagues, um, folks like Matt, and other smart people to help navigate these spaces. And um, so I think the thing that I've learned the most is that you know, no one really ever knows everything that they're doing. And there's a lot of trial and error, and that's OK. And just jumping into it has been really empowering. Um, and what I'm hoping to get out of today is learning from you all about your experiences and hearing your stories. So um, I'm going to pass the mic. Um, I'm Um, I'm Lee. Um, I'm a current master's student in the teaching of social, secondary teaching of social studies here at Teachers College. Um, I'm a high school history teacher. Um, I teach 12th grade civics and government um, at a public school in East Harlem. Um, and I guess that's like generally where my advocacy manifests. Um, I have a focus in refugee and immigration studies. Um, that's sort of like my own background in immigration stories. So I think that that's also where my advocacy is um, and what I hope to get out of this is um, being a teacher, food, food disparity. <laughs> uh, that's something that my students I think struggle with a lot, um, something on their minds. Um, so that's just knowledge about your topic. Thanks and uh, my name is Matthew Camp and Lee works in my office and I learn a lot um, what she's working on uh, in the classroom, and I learn a lot from Claire, uh, who's going around the state um, advocating for school wellness, and uh, I hope to get out today to continue to learn more about what everybody else is working on, um, so I could be a better representative of Teachers College. I'm sorry, so it's who we are and what we're here. To do. What we're here. Hi, I'm Sarah. I prefer to not use the mic. Oh. Hi, I'm. Hello. Sorry. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm a teacher. I um, I teach pre-K special education in Queens, and I don't have that much experience in advocacy. I would like to gain more. Um, why I'm here, I'm attending this workshop. I do meditation with my kids, I do yoga, and I would like to learn more about 
how they could, how to be a wellness advocate. Hi, I'm Miriam Aristi Farrer. Um, I'm a resident in the community. I'm also I chair the Health and Environment Committee for Community Board Nine. Um, I also separately, independently, I am the founder of a plant-based body care line, um, which which also has CBD in it. And um, I'm here. My experience in advocacy is I've been involved in my community education council for district six i was its president i've been on community board i've been involved basically for my son is 14 15. i dropped him off at a school um, north of us and i'm i was born in washington heights i'm dominican and i'm bilingual and college educated and i walked into the school and i realized the lack of equity and resources and how it, if you didn't speak the language, it meant you were agreeing with what was being handed to you, which was the bare minimum. And I haven't stopped being involved in the community since then. And what I expect to get out of here, um, um, I need to bring a lot back to my health committee. Um, our district needs a lot more knowledge in uh, sustainable practices. Um, and also for my business, um, personally, it's wellness is, is very important to me. Um, it's, it's a lifestyle that I like to encourage people to um, follow, um, just be healthier. Hi, my name is Savannah. I um, am originally from the Bronx and uh, my experience with advocacy um, has mainly been around like nutrition education. Um, I'm an advocate for my students. I'm involved in a community garden in the Bronx. Um, I bring a lot of attention just locally um, to my community about using food stamps at farmers markets, etc. Um, my background is in biology and I'm a second year master student in education policy now. I'd like to eventually go into um, a PhD in public health. Um, but I wanted to learn a little bit about the intersections of like education and policy before going into just like an MPH program and didn't feel like that necessarily um, addressed what I wanted to learn about the structure and um, like history of education. Um, so I'm hoping to just uh, get a better um, kind of like lay the groundwork better for myself, understand more about New York because I haven't lived here in a little while even though I grew up here. Um, and um, also just hear what other people in the teacher's college community um, have to say about wellness. Hello everybody, my name is Charmaine Jones, but I go by my nickname Cha Cha. Um, I am a Master's of Applied Physiology student here at TC. Uh, my previous experience for advocacy was more along the lines of um, advocating for low-income students and um, fundraising for student-led scholarships, um, and also um, advocating for the homeless in San Diego, which has a pretty large homeless population. Um, currently, most of my work will focus on uh, health education, specifically in the Harlem community. Um, I work at Harlem Children's Zone, um, where I do a lot of health education with um, high school students and their families. Um, and my own, my self mission is to prevent like chronic illnesses um, through exercise and nutrition. And so, what I hope to get out of this is to just learn what I don't uh, what I don't already know or learn what I don't know. Um, and pretty pretty open minded. Hello everyone. My name is Shivana. I am in the Ed Policy Program here at TC. Um, Previously, um, I worked in higher ed and volunteered in many spaces relating to education, um, you know, high school achievement, college access, um, and also served on the board of a nonprofit that kind of worked to provide wraparound services that the local school district did not. Um, so my interest in this session specifically is in that my approach to ed policy is very much like a Maslow approach of like you can't have successful students if they don't have food, water, shelter, like basic tenets. So I'm really interested to see how um, advocating for wellness within the education space can kind of help um, support my interests within the education policy space. So, yeah. My name is Jamie. I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, I'm only in the city on Fridays. 
Uh, I'm a doctoral student here. I'm in the nurse uh, executive program. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I've been working in mental health for about 15 years. And my advocacy is primarily through uh, patient advocacy. Uh, I hope to be part of CMS reform, which is medical assistance and Medicare. Um, and I think that's about it. So I hope to learn a lot here. Allentown. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray, and I am a, uh, bless you, a second year master's um, in community health education uh, program here at TC. I, um, I don't have a direct and formal experience in advocacy, although I completed a year of service with AmeriCorps last year in Chicago. I taught where I primarily taught comprehensive sex ed to high school students, also mental health and nutrition. And I saw that there's, um, it's alarming in terms of like comprehensive sex ed and we need to do more um, about that. And what I'm discovering right now and what, I'm, what we're seeing in media um, with sexual and gun violence is that majority of the perpetrators are men. And that for me is alarming. I feel like something's wrong and we need to fix it. Um, and so I wanted to continue with uh, my doctorate in um, edu uh, education and health education and look at how we can use comprehensive sex ed to reduce, if not eliminate, um, sexual and gun violence in the United States. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Doreen Davis. I work with the Department of Education as a school food service manager. I have no experience in wellness advocacy, so I'm here to gather information to take back to the schools and also for my own personal benefit. Hi, my name is Dr. Miriam Benchag Ellis. I'm a parent. Um, uh, I had, I don't know if I have, I mean, I have been practicing advocacy without knowing it, just by being in the cafeteria with the kids or uh, by uh, bothering everybody about the ingredients in uh, what you are eating and uh, starting a campaign with our green team right now in my daughter, my baby's elementary school, uh, about what is the relationship between palm oil and uh, climate disruption. So... I'm interested in wellness, and uh, we just had a, a health and wellness council established in our in my baby's primary school, elementary school. So uh, it's very, uh, come on dear, uh, come on dear. It's very like okay, it's in on the paper. The application is on the internet, but what do we do? The façon concrète, concrete, concretely. What do we do and how do we apply anything to anything? So the principal automatically put the PE teacher as the head of that health and wellness council, which is a good thing. My advocacy, if I can do, if I can learn how to do advocacy, would be to encourage all the schools to have a wellness council and to ask for a grant and to so the mental health issues, mental health. And not only elementary, but middle school, and then from middle school going to high schools, it's absolutely uh, it's necessary, and uh, we have to start somewhere. Elementary is a good start, but so what? Else? So if I can learn anything, that would be helpful. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria. Um, I am a graduate student in the International Educational Development Program. And I'm not sure if I've had advocacy in this space, but I've worked before um, with the homeless um, crisis in New York City um, for Coalition for the Homeless and WIN. And I really enjoy that. And my interest in wellness is from the fact that I was just working at a network of um, private independent schools here in New York City. And I noticed the amount of anxiety and panic attacks that children are having these days. Um, and it's kind of crazy because this is a school that's, you know, the population is, you can say, like, very well off, and yet they had so many panic attacks. And so what I did this summer is I incorporated um, doing meditation with the students after lunch, which was a very small thing, and it was very informal. I bought it um, like a prayer bowl, but 
the difference that it made on the kids and how much they craved and got so excited for it was pretty impressive for me. Um, and like getting pre-K children to calm down, second graders to calm down is crazy, but it made me realize the need for that in our schools. Like our children are overly stimulated, exposed to so many things all the time. And then I served in the um, board of a charter school in Queens where I noticed that it's in this area that's a food desert, so they don't really have access to fresh foods. And so the lunches are, you know, pretty low quality. So I'd love to know more about that space as well. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all so much for sharing. I mean, I feel like we actually sort of teed up um, the exercise we're going to do later, which is about storytelling to inspire action and how we can tell our personal stories to actually move issues along and get people to take action um, that we think will uh, move the dial on policy. Um, and I, I just want to also say, I, I have a child in public school here in New York City, so I do experience these things every day. I'm trying to start our wellness committee. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, even in my outside of my work, I, I too am learning how to do this, which is, can be really different, you know, working within your own school community um, and navigating those relationships versus like working with legislators on, on a bigger scale. Um, so, I mean, I think what I will say as a, as a caveat is that I'm not going to go too deep into like any sort of subject expertise. I mean, I think I, I, what I will do is share these two campaigns that I've been working on that have to do with school wellness and, and that really touch on, I think, uh, most of the things that have been talked about today. So just in terms of seeing an example of like what a campaign looks like. Um, oh, hey, Pam, do you want to just really quickly introduce yourself before I jump in? Oh, hi, my name is Pam Cook, and I work with Claire at the Tish Food Center and teach courses here. And well, I've done a lot of advocacy experience with Claire. I guess that was pretty similar. Um, and what I hope to get today is to hone my skills and being able to make what I'm trying to advocate for really passionate to people. She's my boss. Don't worry, don't worry, okay. Um, so, yeah, so just to say, but, you know, as we go on, like, when, I, when I'm done with my presentation, if there are any more substantive questions you want to ask, um, do we have plenty of time for Q&A before we jump into the presentation, into the activity. Um, but I really, in other times I've done this, we didn't have enough time for this activity, and I really, I'm excited, especially with this group, because I think you guys are really well prepared for it, so I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on the time. Um, okay, so... Pam and I are with the Laurie M. Tisch Center for Food Education and Policy, which is in the program here at Teachers College. Um, and this is our mission. We cultivate research and connections between a just sustainable food system and healthy eating and translate it into recommendations and resources for a whole wide audience, including educators, advocates, policymakers. Um, and we really do focus on schools, not exclusively, but that really is where the majority of our energy is spent. Um, so I'm going to talk about two campaigns that we've worked on through the center. One is a New York City campaign, and one is a New York State campaign. We had been doing federal policy for several years, um, and with the change in administration, it just felt like there was very little opportunity to make any meaningful changes at the federal level. I mean, there's opportunity to sort of <laughs> stem the tide of turning back policies that we had advocated for previously, but not necessarily really make any sort of um, positive changes. And so at, um, our, we decided to shift our focus to state and local policy and really see how much we could accomplish there in collaboration with our colleagues. So um, I'm going to start with the New York City one, and then we'll move to the New York State one. And I'm going to go pretty fast. I'm, I'm going to really, you know, I'm going to give you like a pretty high level overview of these campaigns. Um, so a couple years ago, uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, we published a report that we've been working on for a while about the state of food nutrition education programs in New York City. And so, Savannah, you mentioned that. Um, 
we we called it A is for Apple, and we really wanted to understand what uh, what does this landscape look like? You know, there's like 1,800 schools in New York City. Is there this programming in every single school? Like, who are these people? Who are these groups? What are they doing? What are they teaching? Who are they reaching? Um, it turns out there are like 80 organizations uh, running well over 100 programs. We really dove deep into 40 of them who we had gotten data from. Um, and basically what we found is that there, it's pretty inequitable in terms of the access that children in New York City have to this kind of opportunity to really get the skills and excitement to make healthy choices both in school and outside of school, right? So we found that just over half of schools have a program going and pushing into the school. So this isn't what teachers themselves are doing. Um, we did not capture that. But in terms of these outside programs coming in, um, just over half of schools had at least one. Some have far more than one, as you can see. Um, but almost half of schools have none. So, you know, that really stood out to us and our colleagues who had worked with us on this um, research project. And we were like, okay, you know, there's 80 organizations doing this work. Yes, there are 1,800 schools, but we should be able to get at least all schools to have this kind of programming, if not all children, because all children should have these op opportunities. Um, so we presented this report, and afterwards, all of these different organizations, and when I say our colleagues, these are the organizations doing this work in New York City schools. Um, and everyone was like, okay, we can't just look at this and say, all right, business as usual, we need to do something about this, but what are we gonna do? Um, and so we got together with a smaller group and said, all right, let's figure it out. Do we wanna organize? Is this time for a coalition? Is there a campaign here? What is this gonna look like? Well, you know, the 10 of us sitting in a room can't decide anything for the whole field. We need to do, we need to do something to get a broader feedback. So, oh God, wrong one. Um, so we held a summit. Uh, this was at Brooklyn Borough Hall, um, and we brought together about 75 folks from, many from programs, but also from schools and community education councils and some parents, um, no students, that was really lacking and something we're really thinking about how to build that into this work. Um, but it took folks through a series of exercises to say, okay, like, what, are, what do we need to get to 100% of students having this kind of opportunity? Great food, great food nutrition education, culturally relevant, focused on sustainability, focused on justice and equity. Um, we did a lot of like visioning around what are the values that should inform this work, um, and ultimately came up with this vision that all New York City students have healthy, equitable, sustainable, and culturally responsive food access and education. So that's a big vision, um, but it's it's a good one. It's a good target to have and. You know, what you find sometimes, I think, when you start organizing is that opportunities present themselves out of the blue. And this is what happened here. Um, a council member, Rafael Espinal from Brooklyn, um, got in touch with Teachers College has a lobbyist, a city lobbyist. And he, they had been talking. He was like, I really want to do something around, you know, kids' health and well-being. And he's really into meditation in schools as well. Um, and he's like, what should I be doing? And we were like, oh, <laughs> we can tell you what you'd be doing. Um, but this was, it was around this time last year, and this is when the city budget is starting to get um, made. And so it was like, we, we, we went from a report to all of a sudden having to have a coalition and a platform, policy platform, within like a couple of weeks. So we took all of the great ideas that had come out of that summit, and we put them on a board and we invited everyone to come, and we literally discussed them and then dot voted. Have you guys ever dot voted where you, you, know, you put stickers and whichever ideas get the most stickers? That's what we did. So we came up with five. Now these, are our, these were our policy priorities, so not necessarily our overall priorities that we're gonna get to this vision, but at least our policy ones that might have a budget aspect. So um, having a wellness coordinator in every school, making sure that every school has funding for wellness programming, um, having a hub to really bring together all of these groups that are doing this work because clearly, you know, there needs to be some coordination and collaboration being facilitated. Um, forming a youth food ed council, so really getting some student-driven change in this um, arena. And then trying to figure out, you know, I mentioned we don't know what teachers themselves are doing, and we know that some classroom teachers are doing a lot, but 
um, that's really the kind of data that the Department of Education would need to be collecting. It's very difficult for like a, a university-based center to get that granular of data. Um, we rallied. You know, this is where we did the real grassroots organizing. So we kind of put the put our wish list out there, and then we said, "All right, we need to bring some attention to it." Um, sort of simultaneously for this platform coming out, uh, Council uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who's down there on the left, and uh, Councilman Traeger right here, who's the chair of the Education Committee on the Council, um, looking at our data, had so we you know we produced this report, right? We gave it to them. They said, "Ah." this isn't right and we need to know what's going on in schools so let's put a bill in to see if we can get those data. So we had a rally for that. Um, these are all of our colleagues. We dressed up in ridiculous costumes. That's very effective, you know, try to get a little humor into this. Um, we got some media. So when you're working with, you know, council members, you can really elevate your issue by, um, you know, you're the experts, right? Like you know more about these issues than any elected official, I 100% guarantee you. And so you really bring value to them. If they kind of have this inkling, like, oh, I'm sort of interested in wellness, you can be like, okay, here's five talking points, here's the data, you know, here's an op-ed that you can have your name on, um, because that brings a huge amount of value. Then they look <laughs> like they really know what they're doing. Um, so uh, we worked with, their, with Espinal's office to get some media. We rallied again, um, this time around the budget, to really make sure that, you know, this is on the steps of City Hall. This was our friend Yadira um, chowding, uh, not broccoli, sofrito. Uh, you know, we, we had all these elected officials shouting sofrito. Like, so really um, showing our elected officials that you have actual grassroots community support behind your issue. Um, and we had success. So all we've all these pieces put together equaled a quarter of a million dollars in this year's city budget um, that came to Teachers College so that we could form this hub. So we didn't get all of our asks, right? I mean, this is a long-term investment that we're making in this uh, coalition and this effort, but there were enough people raising their voices um, in concert around a set of issues that we got this money to start this hub that will help us build capacity to keep this effort going. So that's the story. We started with the research, we got it in front of the elected officials, we organized our community, we had various ways of sort of elevating our issue, um, both in person, through media, um, you know, we, we wrote letters, we made phone calls, um, and this can work. It doesn't always work as quickly as this, I will say. I mean, this seemed unusual. And I think the other thing to say is that Teachers College, and for those of you who go here or work here, I, I really want to give credit to Teachers College because um, most universities, I think, are very gun-shy about supporting advocacy. Um, it's quite unusual to let, I'm like a staff member here, you know, to let me go off and just advocate for something that we think is a good idea and let alone like actually share teachers college resources. Like we got to use the services of our lobbyist. So that's pretty awesome. I, I really give TC a lot of props for that. And, um, and Matt who, who really, you know, championed this. So, um, that helped too. I don't want to discount the fact that we had some professional help as well. Um, Okay. Do you guys want to ask questions? Does anyone have any questions about this before I move on to our state campaign? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so this is my first time ever working with a contract lobbyist, um, both for this, this city campaign as well as for the state one I'll talk about. Um, as far as I can tell, the biggest value that a lobbyist brings is personal relationships with elected officials and their staff members. That's, 
I'm not, I mean, they have, they have like the understanding of how the processes work, right? How the budget process works, sort of who's in positions of power, who's not. That's information that you can get from other sources. I mean, there's this great resource called the Advocacy Institute here in New York City, and you can do trainings. Um, they have tools. They have timelines. So, like, that's all public information. You you may have to work to get it, but, you know, is it nice to be able to c pick up the phone and be like, who's the head of the budget negotiate negotiating committee, and what is the budget negotiating committee anyway? But, like, that information is out there. What I think the real value is, is the relationships that they have. And, and that is something that I think anyone can build, right? Like if you're, particularly if you can find a champion for your issue, an elected official, and either they represent you, right? Like you're one of their constituents, or you can bring to the table folks who they do represent, because especially in local politics, right? Like people care about their constituents. That first and foremost, that's who they care about. Um, and build that relationship. And don't just go to them when you need something, but go to them um, frequently. Share information. Invite them to events. Uh, send them a holiday card. You know, like send them um, pictures of events that you had that you know relate to the issues. Get to know their staff. You know, their legislative directors, their chiefs of staff, their communications people. Um, you can pick up the phone and call and be like, who is your chief of staff? What is their email? Like, this is all public information. It's not always immediately available. You can't always just go on someone's website and be like, who is Espinal's chief of staff? Um, but you can get it. it and they ha I mean, you know, like, these are public servants, right? They work for us. And so, um, and also, the people who work for them are like possibly younger than anyone in this room. Um, and so I, I personally was very intimidated to do this at first. And then my little sister, when she was in college, went and uh, interned for one of our uh, congresswomen. And I was like, oh, it's like Sophie who I'm calling. I mean, it, I don't know. It took away a lot of the mystery and um, intimidation factor for me, I guess, being able to picture my little sister on the other end of that phone. Um, but I think that relationship building is what lot this like literally what they do 100% of their time is build these relationships so that they have them on speed dial, you know. They and any one of us can do that. Really and truly. Um and I think especially having that balance of sort of bringing them into your community and not always making an ask, but then knowing that you can make an ask and they expect that of you. They Someone once said, like, legislators' job is to legislate. When you go take them an issue, they're like, what can I do about this? They want, they want you to tell them, bless you, what legislative or budget thing is to ask. So, um, so is that, it's a great question. Oh. I mean, well, I, I think the ways I just said, you, you build, and then you build people power, and you build grassroots power. Yeah, um, but I, really and truly, it's kind of shocking how much personal relationships drive policy, especially in local politics. I'm getting some head nods, maybe <laughs> folks have experienced that before. Um, so, I th you know, that, that can help. Other qu I saw another hand. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any more like, um, friends in, that, in the schools that lacked the MEP. Mm -hmm. So like, was there like demographic trends yeah. that you could do? I mean, I know you just did one, but like, if you had any more information to share about that. Absolutely. So you can go online, and, and if you look A is for Apple Tish Food Center, you can I, I can also email you a report. I'll get your email address. Um, some of the trends we saw, I didn't go through all the slides of like what we actually found, but um, there were some notable ones. One is that elementary schools have way more, like a higher rate of programming, as, as many of you can probably imagine, than middle or high school. And it kind of looks like this, right? Like, it was like 78% of elementary schools, 
and it was 32% of high schools. And you were talking about what a critical need for any kind of health, I mean, certainly comprehensive sex education, definitely, but, and mental health. I mean, so it's kind of interesting because, um, like, in our state requires health education. Um, K through six, no, K through five, so elementary school, it's the classroom teacher who's supposed to be teaching it. I can tell you, I don't, my son's in third grade, I don't think he's ever had a health ed class on any subject. Um, and then in middle school, you need to have one semester, and in high school, you need to have one semester. So maybe the assumption is that high school students are getting this, but you know, food and nutrition education is one topic among 20 uh, for comprehensive health education. Um, let alone, like, how are you going to cover all these topics in any kind of meaningful way um, in high school? So there really is a need for these programs to push in. So that's one trend. Um, in terms of demographics, so it was kind of interesting. We, we looked at it by, um, you know, the way that, as you guys are all education people, you know that uh, free and reduced lunch rates are how sort of it's a proxy for the level of poverty in a community, in a school. Um, and so it, that kind of looked like a, a bit of a U, like a shallow U. So the schools with the highest rates of poverty, which in New York City is like 99.9%, .9%, and the schools with the lowest rates of poverty had the highest n proportion of programming. Um, you know, I think the reason for that is the richer schools have PTAs that can pay for programming, and the schools with higher poverty, a lot of programs, their funding is tied to like, you need to be in schools with the highest rates of poverty. So they're bringing their programs there. Um, like, so, but then these schools in the middle, which really in New York City means, you know, they have like 70, 80% uh, free and reduced lunch eligible uh, families, the rates were significantly lower. So there's, clearly there's a real need for focus there too. Um, Staten Island had the fewest programs Probably, again, not super surprising. Those were like the major trends, I think. Um, and one good thing is one program, when they learned that, they actually then ended up having bands because they could do Staten Island and programming there um, because of the data. So it shows how data can help to inform education. Yep. These are great questions. Any other questions? OK. Let's talk. Yeah. That's something that the mandatory, the, okay, admin and principal has to have one in every school, or we have to just be rural schools for that? That's a good question. Um, under, so you just teed up this next one perfectly because, um, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll give a teeny bit of background to answer your question, which will then inform this, the next campaign we're doing. So has anyone ever heard of, um, a, a wellness policy, like a school wellness policy? Oh, great, okay. So I saw, I heard some, you have not, okay. So the very brief background is that in 2004, um, a law was passed as part of this big child nutrition reauthorization bill that funds all sorts of like school meals, WIC, all these different programs. Um, federal law that said any school district, so this is at the district level, that is getting um, federal school meal programs, lunch, breakfast, after school meals, needs to have a wellness policy for the district. And it has to address, uh, you know, many things that I'm sure you're very familiar with around like nutrition standards for school meals, um, food and nutrition education. Uh, and and this, this rule, which was called the local wellness policy rule, evolved over time with different iterations of this bill. Um, the most recent one went into effect in 2016, 2017. Um, it added things in like food marketing in schools. So what kind of foods can be marketed? What about um, competitive foods? So there's a thing called smart snacks, like, you know, foods in the vending machines. Here in New York City, we don't sell food on the lunch line, but some districts do. Um, parties, celebrations, fundraisers. So it's a USDA, United States Department of Agriculture rule which means that it's really focused on food and then a little bit of physical activity. But that is the wellness policy. So every district has one of these. It's a law. Um, every school is supposed to be doing something for this policy. Um, <laughs> my school, 
uh, which was PAM school. I don't even think our PTA or our, stu our school leadership team have any idea that this exists. So the SLT should they should address it. Or the, or the principal. Right. So, so that's why I'm starting a council there. So there is a, a district-wide wellness council for New York City, and there's a district-wide policy, but the extent to which that trickles down to the school level really varies pretty widely. Um, yeah. Wow, that's now awesome. Pushing, like, I'm, I'm in school in Washington Heights, and the kids the first week of school, we are absolutely not allowed. They gave us a list of the snacks we're allowed to send in, snacks that are not allowed. And school age literally takes the food away if they wow. see it. Um, wow. We do across have the whole district. Well, I know, our, well district. I know that it's being pushed across the district. I know our school is taking it very seriously. Better. Their knowledge of food. Yeah. They're, they're the becoming better. knowledgeable just because, like, they're finally realizing that's really bad for us. So the school is, is policing that stuff. Well, and maybe when you combine when you combine those kinds of policies with other supports, like great food nutrition education that's like, okay, let's talk about the companies that are making these foods. Do they have our best interests at heart? Like, why are they, mar I mean, okay, so this wouldn't be appropriate necessarily in elementary school, but in a middle or high school, like, why are they marketing these foods way more heavily in black and brown, na black and brown neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods, you know? And wh wh whose interests do they have at heart? And so, and they've aligned, with they've aligned. okay. Oh wow. Well, so they've also they're also doubling down. We have to be the better of the school. We have gardening. Um, the kids are cooking in the class. They're also um, they have a program. I haven't gone, but it's like a year long teaching the parents healthy cooking and nutrition. Oh, that's all the parents who participate actually get a permit to go shopping at the farm. Yeah, but this is throughout district six. This is in district six one school that's only one school. Mm. I don't know.
the mandate from the superintendent because the district has a high regional safety problem. So he is kind of really making it a priority to all his principals yeah. and checking on them. I don't know if there's a competition in the district, if there's an hmm. incentive. I'm sure there is because my school's taking it very seriously. And, and the parents are, are going. Yeah, and we are a Hispanic school. Or the snack lady mm -hmm. that lays out all the junk food that we ban right at the entrance every day. Mm -hmm. But at least the kids are learning to make better choices and the parents are being taught how to make better choices and they have the incentive to go shopping after they finish class. It's about time to make a junk, junk food zone free, drug I, free zone. The ice cream trucks around the school are just like a double whammy because they idle and yeah. they So, um, in theory, yes, in theory, this, this federal law is administered by a state agency, which is state ed, um, their child nutrition programs. Districts get audited once every three years. The wellness policy part of the audit is literally like a box, like are the, is it in compliance, is it not in compliance, check or no check. In theory, if they're not in compliance, um, yes, they will lose some of their reimbursement that they had gotten. The district will lose some of the reimbursement from meals. And I don't exactly know like how that works. In practice, anecdotally at least, I've heard that that's never happened because what state is going to be like, yes, we want to give back federal dollars. So and, and in there, there's like... No. Right, because the Office of School Wellness that supports this work um, is not an enforcement office whatsoever. They're supports, they're not enforcement. It's a good question. Um, no, it's all about carrots. There's no sticks in this one. Yeah. <laughs> Except for when you have a superintendent, like it sounds, the one from D6 is. But I Perhaps, or maybe an advocate went to them and said, hey, this is a problem in our area. Well, wow. then maybe that's something that we can push at the level of the volunteer parents who are elected at the uh, CCs, mm -hmm. Council Educational Council, Community Educational Council. Yes. Because they are talking to the superintendents. Yep. So your example should be imitated we have 32 districts in the city, so that should be cloned in all, F I mean, repeated everywhere. Having been the CC6 president, I went in there, there was, there was, these are volunteer parents, they don't, they're not experts on wellness, and it's kind of up to them what they do with that position. They can either just go to a monthly meeting and that's it, or you can really go in and do advocacy yeah. and Well, so let's talk a little bit about this campaign, and then, um, it sound, I mean, 
I'm, I'm going to tap each of you <laughs> for these campaigns because you all have so much good experience. Um, oh, this was just to say uh, what we, we want to continue doing. Um, so this other, this statewide campaign is about wellness policy. Um, and this is, it's called the Well Campaign. It stands for well, uh, Wellness, Equity, and Learning Legislation Campaign. Um, I'm not going to show the video because I just want to keep going. But, um, you know, for this campaign, we really, we started uh, first with research. We did a big study on, like, what are the federal, state, and local policies that can support um, health and wellness in schools. We specifically focused on food, nutrition, education, but many of these are broader. Um, and figured out that wellness policy, um, we know that it's a, you know, it's a rule that's out there. Um, but then we learned that 24 states actually have wellness policy laws at the state level, and New York doesn't which is crazy, right? I mean, we're like supposed to be this totally progressive state and why don't we have one of these laws? Particularly because, you know, when you have one of these laws and this is the wonkier part, but very compelling for us is that the evidence shows when you have one of these wellness policy laws at the state level, it actually leads to better district level policies that are better implemented at the school. So it's basically, I think the mechanism is like when a state says, this is important to us, like we care about our kids' health and well-being. Uh, then district superintendents pay more attention, principals pay more attention, and ultimately um, it, it gets better implemented at the district, at the school level. So um, we said, all right, this is crazy. You know, we need to have this state law, and there happened to be funding uh, to support a policy um, uh, campaign. So we're like, all right, let's try it. First big time state level policy campaign we'd ever tried. So. This has been trial and error all the way. Um, but there's a lot of really terrifying data out there to back up why this is needed, right? I mean, the fact that one out of every five students is experiencing mental illness in a given year, that's insane, right? We have one out of six kids who are hungry at some point, one out of three who are overweight or obese. Um, and we know that these issues are all connected. They're, they don't just sit in isolation. Um, so, we have this tool, the wellness policy, and we want a law that is going to be at the state level that will really not make additional mandates. Um, for those of you studying ed policy, I don't, you know, I don't know, I didn't know this before I got into this world, but anytime you say mandate, it's like people almost, you know, have a conniption fit. Like, any sort of additional state mandate is seen as just a total non-starter. And so we're like, okay, fine. There already is a federal mandate. We don't actually need a new state mandate. What we need is tools and resources for districts and leadership from our state to actually make this federal mandate meaningful for school districts and for schools. Um, so we did some more research just to be able to go and say, you know, what is, what are the state of, are, is every district wellness policy in our state awesome? Like maybe we, maybe we don't even need to do this campaign. Maybe this is worthless. So um, there is a great research tool out there that we use to look at a representative sample of policies. There's 732 districts in New York. We looked at 103 policies. They're all publicly available. Um, and we found that in fact, they kind of suck, honestly. Um, you know, these are not good grades, right? Like you would not want to get these grades. <laughs> um, so. In terms of strength, which is how strong the policy is, like using words like they will do this, you must do this, schools have to do this, um, the language was very weak. So a lot of like, you can, you might want to consider, think about doing this. Um, <laughs> and Right, exactly. And then in comprehensiveness, which is really like not just the bare minimum, but all the best practices that we know can really help students be um, uh, have really great health and well-being, not very good. Um, I think most surprising was that almost every single policy did not comply with the federal rule. Like, they're not even in compliance. So clearly, districts, it's not that they don't care about kids' health and well-being. They get it. They know that healthy kids are better learners, but they're really getting almost no support from New York State on this. Um, so we built a statewide coalition not just, you know, we're food and nutrition people, but we brought in mental health folks, we brought in comprehensive sexual education folks, 
health ed folks, um, PE, recreation, dance, um, more just like hunger focused organizations, health focused organizations, parent organizations, um, and came up with these priorities that we want New York State to develop a model wellness policy that will really um, give guidance on how to not just kind of meet that federal bare minimum of healthy eating and physical activity, but really connect the dots between physical health, mental health, and emotional health. So like, let's have a policy that really brings us all together. So that if a district wants to really focus on mental health, there's this model that has language that says, okay, here's, here are all the different sort of practices and policies you can build into your district to really support kids' mental health. If you really want to focus on, I don't know, school gardening, here's language in your policy that you can do. And then we know that policies only mean so much if there's not funding to back them up. So we want some real money. New York is not putting really any money right now towards health and wellness uh, in schools. So um, I don't know if anyone knows this. I, I didn't know this until recently, is that there isn't one single person in our state education department who's focused on health education. Zero. It's a state mandate. Like, it actually is a law that districts have to follow this, and there's no one to help them. Like, if you wanted help with health education, there would be no one to pick up the phone and call. There's one person for the entire state uh, for phys ed and one person who helps with school nurses, and that's it. I mean, it clearly, it's crazy, right? There used to be like 30 people there doing this, and then at this moment, there is not one single person. No. There's no head count. That's crazy. But how, how is that even legal? Why, why are the people like doing that? Is that cool? suing the school? We are the department. <laughs> <laughs> Nicer. Um, because college in Columbia has the first in New York State for more funding. The CFD, the funding to pay for like Oh, yeah. Amazing. And actually, there's a hearing on December 3rd. Um, if anyone's interested, I can forward you the, the invitation for it or like the notification. It's a state ed, um, the Senate Education Committee is holding a hearing on um, foundation aid, which is the formula for how districts are funded. So, okay, let's go. Um, it's here. It's at 250 Broadway. Do I, I, I have. Well, I, I have talked. I talked to him right when we launched to be like, help. <laughs> I don't know anything about, you know, education policy. And 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 I will. And it is all combined, but the conversations around it and the policies around it are not combined. They're so siloed. Op-eds. I have opportunities. <laughs>
the rough process and the disparities in progress between men and women is like 30 percent and then the rest is men and so what they advocate is that people actually ride more op-eds currently in education that try to bring those opinions to the front so that they can actually be heard and understood and then run with cops <laughs> which are fake cops <laughs> fake cops are bullshit of course because <laughs> it's and it's respectful um i forget what ended up happening i think so actually <laughs> <laughs> and it got cut down to like a paragraph and like another op-ed that was written by one of the cops and I was like, oh my goodness. Well, all I can say is that's messed up and we have a PR firm that we're working with. So if anyone wants to write an op-ed, I will seriously help you get it placed. Yes. Okay. So we're going to, we'll do an op-ed. Yeah. Good. Um, Um, I'm looking at the clock. I, I want to, so I'm going to finish this up in literally 30 seconds. I just want to say we've done a lot of the grassroots stuff that we talked about. You know, we've had press conferences. We go to community meetings. I've been traveling around the state. I was in Buffalo last week. There's actually really awesome stuff going on in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to give this one example of wellness in a school, which I saw That's was they, yeah, but they, um, in one of their schools, they had kids getting haircuts. They had barber apprentices getting yeah. haircuts, because if you look good, you feel good. And it was awesome. Like, it, this school, had, there were 42 different languages. It was a newcomer school. There was 42 different languages spoken, and it was really, but I loved the haircut piece. Um, we, we held a talk, a panel discussion to educate lawmakers about these issues. Um, we have been getting some good traction. We got a bill introduced in the assembly, um, but right now this is the time. Like this is the budget. We want this in the budget, and I'm really excited that you guys are excited about it um, because this is what we want. This is what we want in schools. Um, so here are some of these opportunities. Um, the the action I have for you to take is if you go on wellcampaign.org, um, you can sign the petition. But I, let's let's hold on that for a second, and I, I would love to take you guys to like legislative meetings with me. We're going to be doing a lot of those in the coming weeks, so let's. Okay, so we'll talk about that, um, but let's do this. Can we take a pause and do this activity? Okay. Um, so thank you, Pam. So I um we we were lucky through this grant to engage a PR firm and. The fellow, uh, the fellow who runs this PR firm did a training for us, and I can send you the link to it. You can, he's really great, and I think it's helpful to hear him say it. But the point that he made about advocacy when you're in front of a decision maker, right? And that can be a legislator, but it can also be a principal or a superintendent or, you know, whomever, head of PTA. Um, we're so inundated with information right now, right? Like, constantly and, and there's just, we're bombarded constantly. And to cut through all that noise, it takes something pretty special, which is like emotion um, and really hooking someone with something personal. And it's actually hard, right? It makes you vulnerable right away to someone who you don't even know. Um, but to really stick in someone's mind and like get them to sit back and listen for 30 seconds and be like, oh wait, this is something I wanna hear more about that's storytelling and that's telling our personal stories and actually bringing some of our own experience, our own feelings and hopes and dreams into these spaces. Um, so I just wanna take you through an exercise and practice this a little bit because it's, it's not easy. I mean, I, I don't feel like I've mastered it at all and you know we have 20 minutes now, so we're certainly, none of us are gonna master it at all, but just to take a stab at it and kind of take 10 minutes work your way through this sheet and think about, is there a moment, what is an issue that I care about? I mean, you all basically said issues 
early on that you care about? You know, is it every child, you know, children need comprehensive sex education. Uh, children need um, educational equity. You know, my kids need to have, they're too stressed out and they need meditation. So it, pick an issue, um, something that matters to you. Um, and it can be a small issue. It doesn't have to be like climate change is ending our world as we know it. It can be a small issue. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to define yourself just like we did earlier. I'm, I'm Claire. I'm a public school parent. I also work in food policy, you know, whatever, however you want to define yourself, just to sort of bring yourself into their world. Um, you're going to define the issue in a sentence or two. Um, and then this is the part. Why does this matter to you? Can you sort of articulate in a sentence or two, why does this matter? That why, it's not so much the what is the issue, but why is it important? And to do that, then you're going to tell a story. What was a moment or two moments in your life, you know, you noticed that your kids were really stressed out and you brought yoga in. So just a moment that kind of encapsulates this issue for you. Like, was it something you saw, something you heard, something you experienced, something that someone you love experienced? Um, you know, I walked into my son's school and there was a giant jar of Starburst there and I thought, this is the message that my kid is getting every single day when he walks into school that like we should be competing for giant jars of Starburst? I don't think so. Um, then in a sentence or two, you wanna sort of expand the issue. Like, is there a statistic that you can share? You know, my district has the highest rate of childhood obesity in the city, or one out of six kids is hungry in our city, or, you know, or, so it's like, this is my story, this is why it's important to me, but it's not just me. There are all these other people who are affected by this and here is some thing I'm gonna to point to to say that. And then a call to action, which is, and here's what I want you to do about it. I want you to put more money in the budget for facilities. I want you to fund every school equitably. I want you to take junk food out of my kid's school, whatever it is. Um, so I'm gonna hand these out. Take 10 minutes, sit with it, think about it, does not have to be perfect, top of mind, jot these things down. And then um, I'm gonna ask for volunteers to just walk us through them, okay? Let's hear people, okay, I'm gonna be, tell me who I, you can pitch me, okay? I'll be, uh, who am I? Am I, who are you trying to convince of something? <laughs> well, it could be anyone that you, I mean, I'm just giving you more information that you may know, I don't know if you know this. Okay. So, my name is Jamie Trexler, I um, hopefully will be a candidate I took my uh, doctoral exam recently. Can I, um, do you mind holding sure. it? Sure. And this video is going where? It'll go on the website, right? Yeah. Well, we can look at the camera. Oh, oh, I don't know if I want to look at the camera, but okay. So um, I'm a doc doctoral candidate here. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I'm a registered nurse and a nurse practitioner uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm board certified in um, mental health. I'm also uh, certified as an addiction advanced practice nurse. Um, I'm a pediatric mental health specialist and I have worked in alternative schools in Pennsylvania. So using your statistic of one out of five New York City students is experiencing mental health symptoms. That's obviously an issue. Um, I would like to ask for genetic testing to occur to possibly detect folic acid conversion issues. Um, it's free for medical assistance and Medicare uh, individuals. Um, Gensite is uh, a, a one option. Both, both. It's covered for both, so it's free. Um, the prescription count for Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa um, has doubled, if not more, since the 1990s and the fad of Prozac Nation. Um, as a person that worked at a very large pediatric mental health institution, I never wanted to give kids meds. <laughs> I always, I always meet with kids and, I, and their families, and I say, you know, I'm in the business of doing this, but I, I would rather not. Anyway, um, it, probably in the last five, six years, uh, we've uncovered that many patients that suffer from depression and anxiety have a genetic issue converting folic acid. So no matter how much folic acid you get in your diet, even if you get a blood draw, 
And stop me if you guys know this already, but even if you get a blood draw, your folic acid could be normal. The only way to detect whether you have this conversion issue is by having a genetic test. And this genetic test will tell me as the provider whether or not you need L-methylfolate, which is a supplement that is available on Amazon. It's usually not available in health food stores. Um, but it is, you should treat it, this supplement as a medication because your body cannot process folic acid to the point where it crosses the blood-brain barrier to help with the production of serotonin, norepinephrine, all those great neurotransmitters that are responsible for happiness, wellness, sleep, uh, less depression. So instead of giving a child that might be age seven, eight, you know, that is having significant panic attacks, test them. This genetic test can follow them for the rest of their lives. Personally, it doesn't need to be public now, obviously, because of HIPAA. But then they could, we could supplement, we could start with nutrition that could potentially help them, whether it's um, vi checking vitamin D levels, which many of us are deficient, um, supplementing with fish oil. But, but, and these are well-known remedies, but the L-methylfolate is something that we are not, we are not, in the last six years, yes, in the last six years, um, and it was poo-pooed, uh, you know, for years. Um, Kids Peace, which is one of the, a huge organization in Pennsylvania that I worked for, um, our medical director uh, wouldn't, wouldn't use it um, because the science wasn't there yet, but Gensight recently published a two-year uh, study on depression relapse, and they found that if you use the prescriptive, um, use these meds, don't use these meds for your genetic code, people <coughs> relapsed in their depression less. Is there any JAMA publication about What? I'm sure, I'm sure. It's now becoming regular practice in mental health. But um, I did not do the genetic test, um, but you know, I'm trying to be an advocate for my patients, so I wanted to do some experimentation. Um, my brother suffers with depression. Um, there is a genetic link to mental health symptoms. Uh, so uh, it's safe to supplement the diet uh, with uh, 1MG of L-methylfolate, which is available on Amazon. And I didn't really see much, I tried it because I'm, I kind of experiment with supplements. Um, but then I went to the 2.5 milligrams. Can I tell you, the neurons are firing faster. I am, it's go time. It's like, uh, you know, I'm more calm. You want like, it right now? Yeah, I took it today. I took it today. But I mean, everyone, I guess what I'm just trying to say is not only with proper sleep, proper exercise, proper nutrition, but I mean, this could be part of your platform that even though folic acid is addressed in the diet. I, I thought it was, it, only for, it was only an issue for pregnant women, that we have to have our acid folate because otherwise there would be a neurodegenerative for the, for the fetus. Right. So, but well, are you telling me that all of us, we should have Yes, acid? I would, particularly if you're going to have children. But I mean, I would. No, no, and no, I would no, have all the kids. The kids. So oh, of course. Does the pediatrician know about this? If I go to my pediatrician and ask her for this test for my teenager, so come on. Well, so then let's go to primary care. I don't know, but we need to we need to do this so the kids aren't on Prozac and Zoloft at a young age. Okay. I'm ready to get folic acid testing, and you know you told stories. You had a call to action. You had passion. You had emotion. that they're on once we supplement. The pharmaceutical company tried mm. to... Of course, to poo-poo that. Try, no, tried to yeah, package oh. L-methylfolate in the form of Declan. They charged $250. Yeah, they totally charged mm. for it, it was yeah. criminal. They want the money. But you can go to Amazon.com and get it for... But it's still expensive. It is cost prohibitive. For, the treatment is, you know, 20 to $30, depending on the dose. So a month or three, three months, I mean, that's a lot of money. Yeah. For, for a lot of individuals that can't. But you said it's reimbursable by Medicare and Medicare. Guys, the test is. can oh, we the pause test. this just so we can okay. have someone else share a story? Because right. this is awesome. Who else? Okay. So, mine isn't on wellness. 
um, in that I couched my coming to this and that I wanted to learn more about wellness and how I can use it in ad policy. So, um, Who am I? Who are you trying to convince? I guess someone who's going to give me money from like the state or something. Oh, sure, we'll go with that. All right. <laughs> Alrighty, so my name is Shivana. I'm currently a student studying ed policy, um, and I'm also a passionate advocate for equity and representation for underrepresented populations in STEM. Um, a lot of the work that I did previous to coming to Teachers College um, was in the STEM space and that I worked in admissions um, at a couple different institutions, a state school, an Ivy League institution, public and private. So I saw a lot of differences within those schools um, in terms of the populations that were applying to study engineering, computer science, and STEM at large. Um, so the problem I'm trying to fix is increasing the pipeline of women in underrepresented populations in STEM but not only increasing that pipeline as it relates to getting into higher education and in the workforce, but making sure students are prepared to get into those institutions um, and drive change for their communities through the use of technology. But before any of that can happen, um, the main reason I see this as an issue is because when I worked in higher ed, I saw the disparity in achievement across different populations. There were, um, when I worked at Cornell, there were about 13,000 applications that would come across our collective office's desk. And I'd say of those 13,000, a good three to 4,000 just were not admissible in the sense that they did not have the basic skill sets or the experience needed to be an engineer. You can't be a chemical engineer if you've never taken chemistry. You can't you know, be a computer science major if you don't, if your school doesn't offer AP calculus, like you're just, it's not gonna happen. And so the issue I saw was that there are so many students who have the potential to get into STEM, but there's just, somewhere there's a gap. And I don't know if that gap, where that gap begins, but I knew at higher education, it was too late. By the time that application crosses my desk, there's not much I can do except deny you and hope you figure it out some way else. So um, my interest is really in creating um, more opportunities for students earlier on in uh, their K through 12 experience. So whether that be in the supplement of providing after school programs and encourage STEM engagement, making sure students are aware of the information that exists. There's a huge information gap as it relates to what students need to know. Um, because I've seen a lot of success stories that have come from students who were able to engage early on. So. A couple of the examples that I have, um, I remember a young woman, she created an app called 5O, which was an app that she developed in her freshman year of high school through a community program that she was involved in. Basically, the app was designed to um, allow communities to leave reviews about police interactions in their neighborhood. This was, she was inspired to do this through um, all of just like the killing of, you know, unarmed black and brown people in the country. So she made an app to help support that. Um, and then also meeting students who just had really limited perceptions of what STEM was, speaking to students who were like, yeah, I want to work on cars, that's mechanical engineering, right? Like, no, that is not, but if that's where your interest is, I will definitely help you push that boundary even further. Um, so there's just an interest and a desire from students, but just a lack of opportunity in helping them figure out how to explore it. Um, who would benefit from this? Well, everyone, obviously. Um, there would be a greater increase, my hope, in the workforce and classroom um, between men and women. Um, women make up 50% of the U.S. population, a little bit over 50%, but they're only represented at about 19% in engineering-related fields um, in higher education. Um, that number drops off significantly as they enter the workforce, as many who graduate with engineering degrees do not even pursue engineering five years out from their time in those programs. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the basic gist of my interest. Um, and my solution is to provide uh, federal funding to help support uh, more programs in STEM education that happen outside of the, you know, the school day. After school programs, community-based programs that really work to address how can we use technology to com improve our communities, foster interest in STEM and develop skills like resiliency and you know learning that failure is okay through you know trial and error and experimentation and things like that and yeah bettering communities so that's my proposal that has nothing to do with wellness but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will put it in my appropriation after <laughs> Also not about wellness, um, but, okay, um, my name is Lee, oh, uh, Department of Education, um, 
My name is Lee, and I'm a public high school, social studies high school teacher in East Harlem. Um, and the issue I want to address today is that all students, but primarily students of color, primarily black and brown students, are denied access to histories that are relevant to them and resonate with their similar experiences and communities. And the curriculum that we often push is seen as homogeneous rather than context specific um, and specific to the identities reflected in our classrooms. Um, before working as a teacher, I worked in community organizing, specifically on issues of racial inequity, um, specifically refugee and immigration reform um, in the midst of the deportation and detention crisis. Um, and being an immigrant myself, um, I think I understand the idea of being displaced from a home, um, but also in the same vein, in the vein of education, being displaced in your own learning and the knowledge that you may be, have access to. Um, in Providence, Rhode Island, where I was before, 98% um, of students are students of color, um, and 99% of teachers are non-teachers of color, um, so white teachers. Um, and so that 1% of educators doing that labor um, of really pushing for ethnic studies education, um, we're being outnumbered by the homogeneous curriculum that is being pushed by most other schools. Um, and in places like Providence or California where ethnic studies curriculums are being in encouraged and also implemented into schools, um, students have been able to show that they're very, very interested and want these resources, yet these resources are being denied to them. Um, so my call to action is to implement an ethnic studies curriculum intervention committee, committee that their purpose is to write an ethnic studies curriculum to be implemented into schools and that every single high school student should have ethnic studies every single year. I feel like I, I really wrote a lot because I'm gonna use this as an op-ed, I think. Um, I mean, maybe, I don't know. Um, okay, so I'm a graduate student at the Teachers College at Columbia University and I'm a... F Who am I? Who are you? Oh. Who are you asking to take action? The Department of Ed. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm a graduate student at the Teachers College and I'm a first generation American. Um, the issue, it is estimated that a 13 year old child will on average spend nine hours a day on social media and watching TV. I read this in the New York Times, and it's something like that, but it's like a pretty high number. Um, and this overstimulation and overexposure that our children are having with all these platforms is causing so much anxiety and panic attacks and depression in many children. In fact, one out of five students have a men mental illness in New York City. Um, I'm passionate about this issue because in order for a child to grow and learn, they must have the internal peace and practices of self-regulation that meditation and yoga can bring um, about and like just teach the child and especially if they can learn at this age and they can apply it later on in life is so much better. In fact, there's a leader in that space called John Sabatson that has created this home uh, wellness program for different um, issues, medical issues, but I think can definitely be applied for schools. Um, and I, this is important to me and my connection because I applied um, over the summer a series of meditation classes for pre-K, um, first and second graders, and it was really positive. The kids really responded very well to that, and they were eager to have more of that. And I think this is, would be important for students at risk, recently arrived students, as students have, have experienced trauma or violence in their countries. Um, who could benefit from meditation and anybody in general. And my call to action would be um, that schools no longer do timeout as they would do timeout or um, punishment practices and more like in a meditation space where they could actually just reflect. Meditation workshops or a meditation room in each school and NYCHA buildings. Um, meditation content and wellness books in schools, so like a budget for that. Um, and quiet time and, and all that that entails in schools. Okay. 
Okay, I'm I, I'm not so I'm, I'm bon. I speak in my own words. It's half French, half something else. Bon. Um, who are you? Uh, DOE, je crois. DOE, Department of Health. Hi, I'm. Uh, hello, I'm Miriam Benchek uh, Ellis. I'm a parent and previously HIV researcher at Columbia University. Uh, define your issue, uh, problem to solve. I would like to solve many problems around the schools. Quality of food being served, quantity of food being served, uh, how the school meals are being served, consequences negative most of the time of having menus that are not appealing to kids and not healthy for kids. In French, we say, un esprit sain dans un corps sain. I'm francophone, not French, I'm francophone. Um, so, and basically what does it mean? Un esprit sain dans un corps sain means a healthy mental status is achieved through a healthy corpse, a healthy physical health. Um, alors, why are you passionate about this issue? Um, well, because of my faith, religion, I'm obliged to observe all ingredients, food ingredients, like in my daily uh, routine. Um, say, uh, same for my kids. Unfortunately, my kids growing uh, under and with their peers at school learn from their peers um, good and bad habits and have been carried on with bad consequences. One of my daughters gained so much weight that she had to start a diet. We don't, I don't talk about diet around my kids. In my, my husband is, we are, not, we, we, are, we, we are not having that problem, but my number three uh, started a diet and now she lost that excess weight through a severe drastic regime that she imposes to herself. I tried to help by um, taking her to a fitness way, which is uh, put her on a running uh, team. So, and she has been on the running team, which helped her to also decrease. Basically, she was, middle school was all Arizona and chips, Arizona and chips. She wouldn't eat with us, but Arizona and chips, that was her new diet. So anyway, so maybe that's why I'm passionate about this. And I don't, I want all the kids, when I see kids in the morning with a, with a black plastic bag, with that chips and, and I'm not, it's not judgmental. It's just that I want the health about it behind. I just want them to be healthy, like a good piece of uh, whole grain bread, a little bit of butter. Really, we grew up on that, and a little bit of honey, and you feel good. You can start your your, your day at class, but you you do not have the salt and sugar problems and all the fat and all the the obesity problem that we see here in America. Hello. Uh, write down what uh, was a moment, a couple of moments that really define your connection to this. Wait, seeing my kids going through the same trends, right? Who else also is impacted by this issue? Majority growing children around me uh, in our house of uh, worship in elementary school, middle school, high school. And one of my, uh, my, uh, my eldest, when she came and she was telling me, Mama, the debate tryouts are so difficult and the teacher is giving me a problem and I'm going to miss my uh, tra track uh, tryout. I said, okay, okay. I heard her three times saying me that. I said, okay, we're going to go for the track because debate is giving you so much stress and aggravation. I want track. Just go for track. You will be fit and... And she ended up captain of her team, high school, one of the biggest high school, the biggest high school in the United States, Brooklyn Tech. So that's that's one of my, uh, comment dire, um, that's what I, I would like to push for. Fitness for the kids, wellness, uh, the menu. Okay, call of action. I would like to push for plant-based diet in schools, in the kitchen, in the cafeteria. Scratch cooking. I just had a wonderful interview. This is a manager from one of our schools. She's managing, I don't know, five or six schools in Queens. Um, herself, she told me that they used, 20 years ago, they used to cook, prepare the, the chicken, wash it the day before, leave it overnight with the spices and all this stuff, and cook it for the kids. Now we have things wrapped, which is carcinogenic for the kids, etc. That's another uh, subject, but so I would like to push for, yes, scratch cooking in the schools. Uh, also, increase on uh, all forms of social emotional education, and we don't have that. And I see kids in my elementary uh, school, my, my baby school, who are having 
serious issues. And they come in the office, they're having a tantrum, the principal has to take the kids in her office, lock the door, calm down the kid, etc., etc. But we noticed something. Uh, one of the teachers started at Easter, you know when there is Easter, she started having eggs and then she has the little chicks. And from there, one of the parents took the little chicks and said, I can't keep them. She was like, take them away. No, 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 we can't keep them. And we started the chicken club. So all these kids who had fits and were tantrums in the classroom or, or outside, they had to go to the principal office. Now they were coming very early in the morning asking, can I take care of the chickens, the chicken club? So we have to think more about like around this kind of, and that will be, of course, meditation is a wonderful thing. We have one parent who volunteered, but it didn't happen. We are already November 10th. It never happened. No, she didn't have time. I respect her. So anyway, I don't know if I made sense. You got it. I like that, the chickens part. Yes. I, did anyone else want to do your share doing? She has a great experience. Nothing about this school. Hi, my name is Doreen. I'm a school food service manager with New York City Board of Education. I'm a trained health coach and I'm also a sous chef. Um, the issue in my community, the issue, my problem is um, the large obesity issue in my community. And uh, I found that most families do not have the skill set to shop healthy or to cook healthy. So they opt for their processed food. I would like to change that by uh, teaching them how to cook and how to shop healthy. Um, one of the things that um, got my attention was a 12-year-old boy who went to the emergency room. He weighed 190 pounds and his blood pressure was 200 over 90. The broader issue is that families are being affected, community is being affected. And one famous doctor once said, your food should be your medicine, else your medicine will be your food. So I would, the call to action would be to support an after school program to teach cooking skills. Anyone else? Okay. Do you guys have time to stay? I guess I'm talking to someone in the governor's office okay. or the governor. I didn't quite finish the whole thing, but I'll. So my name's Miriam Aristi Farrer, and I'm a parent, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a community advocate for young people. Um, and what's my problem? I need you to fully fund New York City public schools and just cut it out already. We need to prioritize children. They are the future of this state, and we're not making them the most important part of our state. Um, it's 2020, and as a parent, I'm personally tired of raising money at my schools, of shelling out $300, $400 every September for paper, pencils, notebooks, and every other supply, which is supposed to be covered under the state educational constitution. So um, you really need to change this because I have only two kids, but I think of these families who have 10 children and every September they have to shell out $400 in school supplies per child. Um, why am I passionate about this? Um, you know, I, I was born in Washington Heights, which is a marginalized community, and my parents took me out of there. Um, for a better education, but somehow I came back there and I'm um, educating my kids in the same community my parents took me out of. Um, you know, going into a school, I get emotional when I talk about this because it really bothers me <laughs> that we don't care about our kids. You know, going into a school uptown and you see my my son's first school experience and you literally see that there's just the basics are funded and unless the parents take out the money there's no art teacher there's no after school there's 
nothing supplemental. So you think back at your school, what do you remember of your school days? Taking a, a test, um, going on a class trip, or like a school event, a, a social activity. That's what you rem remember. You remember fun things. Well, a lot of the schools in a lot of these communities don't have those fun things. It's just the bare basics, and kids are being forced to take tests. No one cares what's going on at home. Um, so that's what really bothers me about this, and um, that's why I got involved, because, you know, you, you go into, take Manhattan, for example, and tip to tip, Washington Heights, Tribeca. You go into a school in Tribeca, and the PTA start the school year with $400,000 to spend. Yes, they start the school with $500,000 minimum that the parents raise. This pays for every art program, every after school activity, every supplemental thing. So when you see these gaps in education, it's gaps in parent wealth. So you go into Washington Heights, parents were practically all Title Ones. I'm District 6, which is West Harlem and Washington Heights and Inwood. Parents have two and three jobs. They cannot raise money. They cannot be in the school. The first school that I took my son to did not even have a PTA. When we got in, um, that's what propelled me to get involved. There was no PTA, no activities, nothing additional happening for those kids. You come in, you take a test, you do your homework, you go home. Not a single activity was happening, not even school pictures. Um, I was able to, with a group of parents, we raised money that year and we kept it going. That's what's really propelled me to be involved. That gap in the richest piece of island in this country, which is Manhattan. And in a matter of 12 miles, you will find a $500,000 difference in September when schools start on just fun, fun money. Um, and just to, to share how um, drastic that is, when I became a Community Education Council president for District 6, the district office is on 186 and Broadway. If you ever went up to that part of the neighborhood, you would remember there were trailers in the parking lot of that school. Trailers have always fascinated me. I was born and bred in New York. We don't have trailer parks in New York. People do not live in trailer parks in New York City. They do not live in trailer parks in Manhattan. So it always shocked me why schools had trailer parks, trailers in their parking lots. So I started asking more what's going on in those trailers. I found out it was um, kindergartners, English language learners, and special education children who in the island of Manhattan were being introduced to their educational experiences in a trailer in the parking lot of a school. Upon further inspection, these trailers had mold, had rats. Um, it was uh, it was disturbing that I, as a volunteer, had an office in that space, in that building, and there were adults in that building who were not, who didn't care that there were children being introduced to education in a trailer. Um, it bothered me so much that um, when we got a new superintendent, my first meeting with him as the council president, I just told him, look out your window, what do you see? And he said, well, I see trailers. And I said, do you know who's in there? And um, that was my introduction to the trailer, telling him, you have to change that. You have to, that's not okay. Um, to speed forward, those trailers are gone. Um, that's gonna be a beautiful green playground park um, for the whole community. Um, but that really bothered me. And um, it, it really showed a systemic problem to me and, and this is a broader issue. It's, it's not just my district, it's not just my experience. It's a systemic problem that we're not funding schools or education adequately statewide. Um, it's happening in rural districts, suburban districts, and you see the, the gap in Manhattan. If you just look at Tribeca and look at Washington Heights, it's, it's, it's appalling that adults accept this and that the governor would accept this and continue to fund our public education system in this state with the foundation formula that is about 20 years old. 
Um, and that's my call to action, change that form foundation formula and start funding schools adequately in 2020 because we know better. And as, you, as we know, we need to think about the whole child, mental health, wellness. It's not just passing a test that's gonna make a child successful, it's the whole package and bringing the family into the school. And we can't do that if we're not funding the schools adequately and if we're funding them on a foundation formula base in, of the 1970s, which is insane. What institution today can function on outdated found financial formula? Every, every private sector will update its financial formula, its financial forecast, its financial planning yearly um, based on trends, based on what's happening, yet New York State seems to think that it's okay to educate kids in 2020 based on a 1970 formula. That's all. Thank you guys enough for sharing this time and your space and your stories and your passions and um, I learned a lot and um, I'm really excited to maybe bring you in with some of these efforts. I think all of you have a lot to share. Um, can I follow up by email? Yes. Oh, it's Jibble just coming. Thanks, Jibble.